First Samuel, the book of First Samuel, chapter 19, and I want to read one verse, verse 12. One verse, verse 12. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. So my cow let David down through a window, and he went, <laughs> that's a word right there, and fled and escaped. The word of God for the people of God. You can take your seat. Jinkums. I think you say jinkums is the word of God. It just means so much. Jinkums. Every time you think you've exhausted it, something else pops up. Jinkums. <laughs> well, we this year are under the theme kingdom dynamics. Kingdom dynamics. How things happen in the kingdom. How they move. A dynamo. An engine. And then we are on the series, Kingdom Design, The Life and Legacy of David. Now today we want to minister from the sermon topic, a window of opportunity. A window of opportunity. I begin. In the beginning, when our sovereign God created heaven and earth, he did so by implementing in the earth Time-keeping methods. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, there were time-keeping methods. God is a God of order, and so he orders that each 24 hours be broken up into time increments. Let me read about it. Genesis 1 and 5, it says, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. God's original plan is that the daytime, I said his original plan, right? <laughs> is that the daytime be used for work and then at night there will be rest. Uh huh. God also instituted a time that should be set aside to worship him. Follow me now. That's called a Sabbath. Mm -hmm. The old covenant, Sabbath, has to do with keeping the law, the Torah. The New Testament Christian keeps a Sabbath because of the cross and resurrection. In other words, we worship on the day he got up. <laughs> the point being is that you must stop work and worship. Can I park it right there? If you work seven days, eight days, 10 days, 14 days in a row, and you don't stop to worship God. I mean, gather together and worship God. I don't know about you, but that's a kind of strange kind of thing right there. And so we've got to stop the work at some time and gather together for corporate worship. Am I right about it? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Now let me say here is that got an attitude at this part right here. The shame is, is that we will make time for the man. <laughs> we ain't late. Matter of fact, we're five, ten minutes early in case we need a little extra five, ten minutes at lunch or, or we need to make an appointment after work. We can say, well, you know, we did come five, ten, fifteen minutes early for the man. But I, I'm interested in people who know how to worship and make time for the creator of man. Oh, I'm going to help somebody out right there. You see, I'm going to make sure that in this house that we understand that we make time for God because God took out time to make us. Talking about, talking about timing, y'all, how you handle time, timing. God set out the formation of mankind to continue to happen through something called maturity. Maturity happens over time, you know. Yes, yes. You move from being an infant to toddler to child to preteen to teen to young adult to adult to mature adult to older person and then to an elderly person over time. And in each stage there is, listen, there is a certain, there are certain things that you have an opportunity, a window of opportunity to do. I'm, I want to say that again. That at certain ages, at certain times in your life, you have a certain amount of time, a window of opportunity to do what you need to do. You 
should not reach adulthood and still be doing what a baby does. I shouldn't see no adults trying to pacify. Yeah. No, that window of opportunity is gone. You know, we do not I said, I don't let we do not expect to see a 70-year-old couple talking about let's have a baby. That time or window of opportunity been going. So I want to join Solomon, the wise Solomon here, and remind you of something from Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. It says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And I need to encourage the church now. You've always got to monitor your days. You've always got to monitor your time. And then you've got to decide, God, what is it that you would have me to do during this opportunity of time that you've given to me? In other words, you shouldn't waste time. You shouldn't play with time. You shouldn't placate time because that's God time because guess what? No one knows when they're going to be called out of this earth. There have been a couple of surprises this week. So we don't play with time. Don't play with time. Then how about this verse here? 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I, I thought as a child. Huh? But when I became a man, an adult, I, I put away childish things. Lord have mercy. I like to encourage young people to get your education while you can. I'm going to slow down right here. Because I do too much counseling where they allow the window of opportunity to pass them by. I want to say again, young people, while you can get your education, it is easier to do so while in the home of your parents. Yay! Oh, come on, parents. Come on, pa You better back a preacher. <laughs> then after you've moved out, on your own, paying your own rent, your own electricity, your own cable, your own food. You better stay home, get your education. <laughs> yeah, 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 I heard that there on ministry, I heard that. Now, easier to do that, get your education while you're young, before you've had a child or two. I'm just being straight up. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you, I have a sister, brilliant, wonderful, Oh, it's super intelligent. She had to learn these. She had one, two, three. She had three before she got back to school. And thank God for what God has done in her life. But I'm going to tell you, and she'll be the first one to say to me, Maria, you know you're talking right, that it would have been easier if I had taken care of the schooling business before I had child number one, child number two. Child. Oh, see, let me tell you something. See, let me tell you something where we act up. You know the preacher's right, but you're scared to agree. You better just agree. A window, a window of opportunity, hear this, has a time limit. A time limit. Only so much to get done in that time limit. Only so much time to make your way of escape. Hmm. Make your way of escape out of poverty. Out of having the job that you really don't want. <laughs> make your way of escape. So do what you should do at the front end. So, okay, I'm, I'm just... just so let's go now to the text and examine it with these three points in mind. Point number one, showing off. Showing off. Point number two, showing up. Showing up. And point number three, showing out. <laughs> showing out. So let's deal with it, church. Point number one, showing off. Let me begin by asking you this question to consider. Can God show off in you? In other words, can God, watch it now, use your life to demonstrate that in spite of war or the warfare, that you will survive and thrive because God's hand is upon you? 
Now, that's a lot to celebrate right there. I, look, that person says, I might have missed my window of opportunity in my earlier years, but I got it together. And, and now that I've got my life together, now that I've made the right choice today, and, and I know that it only takes a mere five years. Everybody knows my famous five-year cycle. In five years, my life will look nothing like what it looks today because I made a choice to allow God to show off in in my life. I would dare say that the oil of God, hear this, makes you slippery to the hand and the plan of the Sometimes, sometimes I look at my own life and say, how you survived that? A slippery Christian, slipping her, slip, thought they had me. <laughs> Thought I was going to be taken out. Yes. See, let me tell you something. I can remember a time when depression tried to catch me. Yee! Couldn't have a child. Things weren't going right. Miscarried big time. Shocked to my system. The enemy wanted to put me in a dark room and just, but I can remember when the God used the mouth of my mother and said, Shake it off! Open up those windows, Maria. And I'm telling you, that was it. The light came in. And ever since that day, I've begun to understand more and more that no matter what I go through, that if I hold on to God, he's going to bring me through. And I'm going to be wiser. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be better. I'm going to help somebody out. Because guess what? God does not waste an experience on you. Oh, he doesn't waste an experience on you. If it's good or bad, I said that God's going to work it out for your good. How he does that? Only a God, only the God that we serve can take like a gazillion bad things and then work out the gazillion bad things so that you celebrate the good thing. And that when people look at you, they don't even remember the bad. They don't even remember what you done. They don't remember because all they see is a good thing that God has produced through your life. God will make you make your life a good thing. He'll make it a good thing. Come on, O'Shea. Listen, the, the anointing will secure you in a time of storm. <sighs> Anchored! Come on, don't matter what the rough seas are. I said that when God has you, you're secure. You're anchored. No matter how rough the seas, no matter how high the waters, oh my God, he'll keep you anchored. And so listen to verse 8, our beginning verse again. It says, and there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with great slaughter, and they fled from him. Now, now, now what got me as I read it, war again? There's war again. Sometimes, sometimes out of you, you go through and you wonder, well, why there got to be friction again? Why there got to be issues again? Why there got to be something, you know, is this person clashing with that person, this girl, again. But I'm, you just hold on because sometimes God uses the warfare. He uses the war again type of situation because he needs to show you who you are at this time. Watch it now. Watch it. War again? You know, to see another war, another fight, another argument is normally a negative. It's a turn off. Yet God is going to, es if God is going to esteem you before others, it will happen in an atmosphere of controversy or differences. If you're the same as everybody, then everybody's everybody. But when God is about to announce to you that there's, a, there's something different about you, I have it in you. You may not even see it for yourself. And what I'm going to do, the only way that I can show you that you have something that somebody else doesn't have, I've got to put you in a place of contradiction. I've got to put you in a place you didn't ask for. I've got to put you in a place you didn't pray about it. You didn't pray for it. But God said, I've got to create this storm. I've got to allow this storm. I've got to allow this difference. I've got to allow this warfare so that at the end of it, you'll come out stronger, better, more experienced. Because I... 
God says this, I knew it was in you all this time. Huh? I knew that despite the struggle, you were gonna come through because I created you that way. I put it in you that you will come through with the victory. How you survive? Because God put it in you to survive. Even, listen, listen, listen. Sometimes you feel like just failing. Huh? You ever felt, ever felt like just throwing in the towel? I've ever felt like that's like, like just, just cogno of everybody? Just removing all the emails, just, but yet you didn't. Yet you're still in public, yet you're still here. I'm trying to tell you that in spite of the outward circumstances, in spite of what's going on all around you, there's something within you that pushes you to the next place of excellence because excellence is in you. And let me tell you something. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God just said this. This is a cat, cat. God just said this through the Holy Spirit. He said, and I require my excellence back. Come on, I say. Huh? Huh? In, in, in other words, the excellence that's in you came from God. And therefore, God must get the glory from what he placed within you. That's why you can't give up because it's in you and God is pulling you. You, by the Holy Ghost towards his own self, you can't. I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the world would be easy. But I got, oh my God, I, I, I got to believe. He didn't bring me this far to leave me. He didn't. So I can't give up. Even when you want, I, I, you can't give up. So listen. God places you in these circumstances. The war, circumstances, the war is not to wear you down. It's to wake you up to the next level you. Shama. Uh -huh. The war is not to kill you. It is to show you that you are actually tucked. Lord of mercy, tucked. You know, tucked, mamas know about tucked. If the child is ever frightened, fearful, overwhelmed, they come and they tuck themselves under usually the arm or, or, or the Bible will call it the feather, huh? under the wing, because, because that's their place of safety. Can't get to big mama. You may take out me. You ain't taking out big mama, so I'm going to tuck myself in the presence of big mama. Can I tell you that God, who is our mother and our father, he is our creator. He has a secret dwelling place. He has a place of safety, and that's the place where we can be tucked. And so the war is not to kill you. It's to show you that you are actually tucked in a space where the enemy cannot touch you. But don't mess with a mother and her child. You're going to the grave. Somebody's going to die. Something's going to happen. You don't. And I mean, and the younger the child, it's going to be a war. It's going to be something going on. That beautiful grandbaby. I see two beautiful little baby girls. What? You touch one of those girls. Somebody's going to be after you. Somebody's going to get you. And they ain't going to apologize. And so this, this is the image. Come on now. Isn't God wonderful? This is the image that he presents before us. Now here, the war is not to frustrate you. It is to further fix your mind to know that there is no adversity that will take you down. Lord of mercy, you want the war or not? This thing is for your good. Many times in our humanity, we run away from conflict. We run away from differences. My thing is, hey, in the midst of these differences, if we both have God as our focus, we're going to come out of this. Because guess what? Ultimately, it's not about you, Tammy. It's not about you. And I got to teach people it's about the purpose. It's about the kingdom. Stop getting taken out by people on your level. Get taken up and let God show off in you.
Show off in me, God. Yeah, yeah. War again? Yes, because God, I like this, has a win for you. No war, no win. Yee! No war, no win. Jesus. God will at times release the hedge of protection around you so that you will know that you can take the attack and demonstrate a comeback. That's your phrase for the week. Take the attack and demonstrate a comeback. Take the attack and demonstrate a comeback. Hmm. Look at verse, our first verse again, and we'll see. Well, let's see what this war again produces, verse 8, what it produces. I remind you that Saul wants David dead. The Philistines are more angry with David for removing 200 foreskins from all their dead soldiers. Yet, just the thing, Yashan, God permits war again. I mean, God, isn't it enough that Saul hates me? God, isn't it enough that Saul's servants hate me? Isn't it enough that the Philistines hate me and they hate me with a passion that I don't understand? Why, God, do I have to experience war again? Because God knows what he placed in David. And David, one more time, goes forth. Look at it now. And there is a great slaughter. You saw that word there, Mother De Silva? Not just a slaughter. Great slaughter. Booked them, hit them, what took them. There's a great slaughter. In other words, there is great victory. This is an unusual slaughter. This is a favorable slaughter. This is a supernatural blessing of God upon David, huh? Because he dared to go to war again. As per usual, David's mighty victory sets up something in the heart of Saul. You can't experience victory and somebody not be ticked off. If, if you experience victory and literally everybody is happy, go home and wake up again. It's like Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. Something, something, experience it again. There's no time that everybody is going to celebrate you. And so listen, that's why you've got to learn to encourage yourself and celebrate yourself. Because just in case nobody celebrates you, you better celebrate you. You better celebrate yourself. One person should be smiling back from the mirror. You. You all right, you know. You are okay, girl. Yeah, she got a few lumps and bumps she didn't have 30 years ago. But ain't nobody better than you. You're a bad mama jamma. Oh, I'm sorry, that's just me speaking about me, to me. I felt good saying that, and I said it this morning, too. Mm -hmm. Yes, I need double the material because I've got double the favor now. <laughs> watch it now, watch it. Hey, 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 hey. Glory to God. So, yeah, <laughs> somebody is not going to be happy with your victory. Number two, showing up. Showing up. Sometimes, listen, we trust the words of a person rather than understanding their heart. Mm, that's, that's a deep lesson. Just verses before, Saul had promised his own son, Jonathan, that he would leave David alone. Said he would leave him alone. Yet there is something going on here that must be spoken to. It is spiritual warfare. The greatest warfare going on was not the slaughter on the battlefield. No, no. It was the battlefield going on in the heart and mind of Saul. What a battle! For this battle, my God, caused him to surrender the promise he made to his own son and recapture his own proclivity of hatred towards Jesse's son. Look at it in knowing. 
And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in the house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. I mean, the situation starts out looking the same like it's always look. So I, I reiterate that because of Saul's choices, he moved out of the will of God, and therefore God's spirit was no longer with him, and this left room for the anti-love spirit or for the spirit of evil to take up residence and demonstrate itself once again. Right? So when the Bible says an evil spirit from the Lord, it's not saying that the Lord has evil and he's putting it upon someone. He's saying that when he removes, when he removes his goodness, all that's left is evil. And it's the same with us today. Maria has evil and goodness. And if all of the goodness was removed, all you would experience is the evil. Oh, yeah. So Saul, Saul is sitting holding a javelin. Now, I, I have to imagine, Deacon, that David was a bit more alert. Oh, wait a minute. I'm playing the harp. Hold on, hold on. I've got the harp. Y'all got the jab. Hmm. If I'm playing the harp and I'm hitting every note, why you got the jab? So I can see him, you know, playing, but he'd be looking at Saul. You better keep your eye on your enemy. Find her to a bubble all in the house. Mm -hmm. No, no, I told you that last week. No. So Saul is sitting, holding the javelin, David playing the harp. Can I tell you that a person can go so far in their own ways of hatred and confusion that you're playing the harp or speaking a word of wisdom or praying about it will do absolutely nothing. Nothing. As skillfully, this hit me, y'all, as skillfully as David is playing, it will not be effective. I can preach as skillfully as I want. I can explain this word any way I want. It's about where's your heart in reference to what you're hearing as to how you're going to take this word in. So it's not that David has lost his anointing. <laughs> it is that Saul has strayed so far away from God that the, oh, Lord, mm, the uh, that the anointing cannot reach his heart or mind. Oh, that's a scary thing. That as close as Saul is to David, in the atmosphere of hearing the harp, that because Saul, even though you're only 6, 8, 10, 12 feet from David, you're a million feet away from the anointing of David, from David's favor, and therefore you're not going to handle David how you should handle David. Sometimes pe people treat me like a nobody. Thank God I know who I am. I just recognize you're far away. You're far away. So look at Tan now. Look at Tan. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall. That, that means, that means, you, you got to hear scripture. That means I just don't want the javelin to go through you. I want this javelin to go through you so that it sticks to the wall and you're in between the wall and the javelin. Force. We're talking about kingdom dynamics, but there, there's always, if we're talking about kingdom dynamics, you have to realize there is an anti-kingdom dynamic. So as forcefully and as willfully and as powerfully as you want to demonstrate the kingdom, there are opposing forces that want to demonstrate the total opposite. So, and Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote Saul and he smote the javelin into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. Some of you got to learn how to flee. Saul showed up. Uh, yes, he had that conversation with Jonathan and said that David would live. 
I mean, look at what he had said. Let's go through it. Verse 6. And so hearken unto the voice of Jonathan and so swear. Oh, I promise you, put your hand on the Bible. <laughs> you know, make an oath. Oh, I swear, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. Please, please. The word of a person who has an evil heart must be weighed very carefully before it can be accepted. If it is to be accepted. Saul cannot defeat his inner giants. And this meant that David will always be in danger. Somebody, somebody's after you. It may not be a literal javelin, but it, they're after you so that you do not complete the plan and the purpose and the destiny that God has for you. Oh, there are javelins. Oh, I'll talk about it. Now, what I admire <laughs> about David in verse 10 is that we see that David, listen here, my people who play games will get this. Rhonda, this for you today. David was not only good at offensive attacks. Oh, got that tire. But he was equally skilled in the defensive response to an attack. Oh, come on up in here. You think that every time somebody attacks me, I attack them back? And sometimes you just got to walk away. Yeah. Defend yourself another way. Yeah. Take a walk. Yeah. Smile and move on. Come on now. You know, well, she looked at me, so I looked at her. Well, she said two words to me, so I said four words to her. Well, she touched me on the shoulder, so I made sure I put my finger on her and pressed. Well, what kind of stupidness is that? Sometimes the mature, favored, anointed child of God, you've got to, to know, you've got to know. I just need to walk away. Walk away. All right. Walk away. So looking at David now, looking at David, the Bible says that, watch it now, he slipped away. I told you the anointed slippery. I told you that. He, he, he slipped away. So let's look at the word slipped. Comes from the word pater. Pater. Meaning to separate, set free, remove, open, escape, burst through. See that? You, you ain't got to stay there. You, you don't have to stay there and be attacked. You don't have to stay there and be demeaned. Come on now. You don't have to stay there and just take all of the harsh words they say. You know, you're not more holy. Some people got that. Luana, some people got that type of thought. You know, if I just stay there and hear all that they say, how horrible I am, how worthless I am, God, that makes me more holy. You know, that makes you stupid. Sometimes you just need to walk. And if you can't walk away, shut it down in your ears. Protect your ear gates. Protect your ear gates. That's what I heard for this week coming up. Protect your ear gates. Amano. So, 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 so that night, he had a, watch this topic, window of opportunity. That night, he had a window, David, a window of opportunity. No sense, Elder Trot, no sense like the last time letting Saul have another throw of the javelin. Last time, he threw the javelin twice. You don't sit there and go, okay, I'll let him throw the javelin one more time. I uh, let him throw the javelin one more time. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Listen to me. You have to know when to escape with your life. You know, it's like the abused woman. I'll let him. Oh, yeah. He won't hit me again. I'll give him a chat. The first time. I'm telling you, if he had ever hit me, if he had ever hit me in the beginning, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. This is the only time I become speechless. I, I don't even know what to say. I'm moving on. I have no words. Because you didn't stand in front of that altar, take me from a loving hand to put your hand. Okay, we're well back to the tax now. And so listen here, church. Saul had a, had a javelin, but whether it be a javelin, a knife, watch this now, a joint, okay, I forget. a jest, a joke. Some people pretend they're joking with you, but they ain't joking. 
a word, a sentence, a paragraph, that becomes their javelin, you know. Some people's words become a javelin. Their jokes become a javelin. Their jests become a javelin. You've got to know, and you better know when to escape for your life. Yeah. And so whether it be a javelin, a knife, a joint, a jest, a joke, a word, a sentence, a paragraph, whatever it is that desires to remove you from your destiny, use the time to escape. Lord have mercy. Don't, don't waste time. Don't waste time. You've got to escape. Listen to 11. Saul sent messengers unto David's house to watch him. See? Okay, watch him. Saul's by, Saul, you think Saul ain't, Saul knows I've got so much time. Saul sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. Make sure he doesn't escape the house. Guard the, guard the doors. Guard the doors. <laughs> and my cow, I'm going to help you out here. And my cow, David's wife, told him, stop right there. I want you to know, I got it during the reading of the scripture, that the word of God says, and my cow, David's wife. I'm going to show you something right now. That right now, her primary focus is, I'm David's wife. Because there's going to come a time in sermons to come when it's going to be, she's my cow, soul's daughter. But right now, She's pretty happy. I think it's still the honeymoon, you all. She's still pretty happy. And, and right now, she is David's wife. And my cow David's wife told him, saying, If thou shalt not save thy life tonight, can you imagine? Can you imagine the tears? Oh, honey, sweetie pie is after you. You got to go. You got to go today. No, I want you to stay here forever and be with me. And we can live happily ever after. But if you don't make your escape tonight, there's going to be no happily ever after possible. <laughs> so that's what she's saying to him. She's saying to him, there's a time limit. There's something going on here, David. And, and David, I've got a message from somebody. Always an inside story. I know how Trump thinks it's going to be. <laughs> Mueller got some inside information. You know Mueller seen those tax receipts? I ain't saying nothing else. It's always somebody on the inside. Got a little extra information. Going to slip it to the press. Oh! And so in likewise matter, nothing changes the same. The message gets to my cow that, hey, tomorrow morning, Saul going to kill David. And so she knows she's only got so much time. Only so much time. If thou shalt not save thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. She didn't put a question there. She said, you're going to die. So time is of the essence. Saul's men are on their way. Can I tell somebody here, Saul still on his way? Uh, that the enemy of your purpose, the one who does not want you to walk in the will of God, the one who does not want you, to become the example in the kingdom that God has already scheduled for you to be. Th th that type of person, they're always on their way. Mm -hmm. They're coming to get David. They're coming to take David to his place of execution. You see, this time, Saul wants David more than dead. He, he, I, I need to explain it. He wants David more than dead because he could send somebody to kill David. But no, he said... I want to kill him. I want to kill him. No, don't touch him. Bring him. Saul wants to be the very one to kill him. You ever notice? You might. You might. You ever notice in your life, you've got to be at least 40 years or so old. Maybe you see it earlier. That is always the same person after you or always the same type of person. Yeah. That, that's the soul spirit that's trying to wreak havoc on your life. It's just the same personality, even if it's another person. It's the same personality doing the same type of thing. Now, recall from our last sermon that the trick and treat were for soul. The trick was that Michal loved David. 
the treat for us that my cow was going to be a snare or a trap for David. That's what Saul was celebrating. Yep. Can you imagine? I know they're up there on the honeymoon. Let them enjoy the last night together. He ain't good nowhere. I can't expand on that. I'm just saying he ain't good nowhere. Uh -huh. Here we see both now. Trick and a treat. Saul believes that he has David trapped in the house with my cow. Yes. Uh, yet the love that my cow has for David is the way of escape. Yes. Her love becomes the way of escape. For she warns David that if you stay in this house, tomorrow you're dead. So she warns and she weaves. She weaves a plan. She, I didn't say she weaves hair. I said she weaves a plan. She weaves a plan. It will involve here. <laughs> and the plan is to let him down through the window. There, there, there's a window, and while they're looking at the door, <laughs> God can make a way. <laughs> can I tell you something? The enemy is always looking at the logical place. I don't feel kind of too much. He's looking at the logical place of your escape. Yeah. Where he knows a sane, logical person yeah. should escape. Yeah. But when the Holy Ghost is upon your life. Hallelujah. And listen now, let me help you. So, I see it here, Holy Ghost. At that very moment, he is connected in a divine covenant called marriage. So that at this moment, not only is the creativity of David for David, but the creativity that is upon David is also upon his wife. There's a covenant of creativity because of the anointing that's on David. And so now she says, we can make a way of escape. And, you know, I heard it this morning upstairs. The rope will be as long as you need it to be. I don't care how high. Oh, Jesus. I, I don't care how high the window is. I, I, I don't care. You know, you say, what? A 80 feet? It's an 82-foot rope. <laughs> all that, all the way down there. See, because the houses were built high. And therefore, the logical thing is, David's not going to escape through a window. He got to go through doors, go through downstairs, and get down on the level. But God will make your way escape because there's a highway to heaven. God knows about highway escapes. That that. Because you're anointed, he will make sure that your rope is always long enough. Yeah. Yeah. He will, I'm telling you, you may be saying, this is too harsh. This is too much. I can't take it. I say, yes, you can. God has given you a rope, and he's given you a window, and you better move. And he shows you the rope, and he shows you the window. Ain't no time to try to outthink God. Climb out the window and lower yourself and escape. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. So this is his window of escape. This is the time, a time, that my cow chooses David over daddy. This is a time, I'll say it again, when my cow chooses David over her daddy. <laughs> and you always have to choose your heavenly father over people. This is when what Saul thought should be a trap becomes my cow's treat, a way of escape. The creativity of my cow is in full gear, 13 through 15. And my cow took an image. Boy, that thing looks real. Something spooky. And my cow took an image. Yeah, took an image and laid it in the bed. Look at all the creativity coming in. And put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster, head area, and covered it with a cloth. <laughs> and when Saul sent his messengers, because you know what we all do, right? If we were all in Bermuda right now, flu season, you're coming to the door. Where is he? Where is he, my cow? He's in the room sickly. He is? Okay, hold on. <coughs> <coughs> yep, yep, that's him. Yep, yep. Because you don't want to catch the flu. 
So you, you're not going up the gun. I'm going straight to him. No, you ain't doing that because you might catch what he has. Right? And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said he is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to seek. See that? To seek. See that? Something up on. What, what, what? Probably. Now we got to conjecture. This is where the creativity. He was all right yesterday. Did you all see him? Well, we saw, we were, you know, we peeped in. We saw the, you know, he, he was there, man. We, we saw him, king. Did you lay your eyes on his eyes? <laughs> well, well, no, we didn't. Go back and see him. See him. Sent messengers again to see David, saying, bring him. That's right. Bring him. I mean, what's he saying? He's going to die anyway, whether he's sick or not, he's dying. Bring him up to me in the bed. Bring the whole bed. Saul is so vexed, he would have said, bring the bedroom, bring the bureau, just bring, I don't, just, bring just get David. Mm -hmm. Bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. I want him to die right in the bed. Yeah, yeah. Again, time is of the essence. Now, let me tell you this. Watch this. Time is of the essence, right? She needs to buy more time. She needs to delay this murderous scheme. She must slow down David's messengers and give David more time to get further away. That's what this is about. The cuts made up. It took time for her to make this up, didn't it? Uh-huh. He's already out the window. He's fleeing into the forest, right? Meanwhile, she's making it up. They're coming. They see the made-up image. They go back to Saul. That's more time, more time. Saul says, what? Go, 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 go see him and bring the bear to me. So they've got to come back. And now they see that David is not there. And look at this. He actually looks like he's got an afro, like he's got locks. <laughs> like he's got locks, yeah. So... She makes up the bed so that it looks like somebody's laying in it. I don't want to know who done that in the teen years. I, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Some of you are shaking your head. I said, I don't want to know. Not me. That would be the very day if I had done that. My mom would have come in and say, Marie. <laughs> I do, did have a sibling who I'm sure. <laughs> Not me. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Some of you having memory flashbacks? Yeah. <laughs> she, she makes up the bed so that it looks like somebody's laying there. Again, I will say, and this is important for future sermons, very important. My cow is showing creativity. She is able to create. Right. Now, Macau, her name, her name means who is like God? Who is like God? Meaning, she is a giver. Study the name situation. In study, she is compared to being a little stream that holds water. In other words, she is seen to have the potential of life. That's why her name means who is like God. She's given a God-likeness because of her creativity, because she can, I'm going to say it for the purpose now, produce life. She can produce life. That's the plan. That's how God made her. All right. And here she actually does what? She saves the life of David. Here she creates an image that represents life. She almost saved the entire day. Except her father basically says this. He says this. I don't care if he is sick. I will kill a sick man. I will kill him while he is in his sick bed. Bring his sick bed up to me with him in it. 16 and 17. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto my cow, why, important, why hast thou deceived me? 
and sent away mine enemy that he has escaped. And my cow answered Saul. Right? Notice it doesn't, I, they're catching the Come on, my students, my preachers. It does not say, and my cow answer her daddy. They, mm -mm. Right now, she's still, she's still in love with David. So she says, he said unto me, let me go. Why should I kill thee? In other words, she said, he turned on me. And he said, if I don't let him go, he's going to kill me. So I had to. I had to. Yeah. I'll tell you, this is better than. Yeah. Better than reality TV. She says, David threatened my life. And so she had to. You know, can you imagine? Daddy. That's a minute, Daddy. I need a drink. Hold on, Daddy. Hold on. It was terrible. It was terrible. I, 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 knew, I, knew, I knew your messengers were on their way, right? And um, I just said, something's wrong. I said, something's wrong. And um, I wanted him to stay. Because, you know, we just got married, right? I said, David, don't go. David, don't go. Stay, David, stay. I did everything I could. I did everything I could. And um, I even held on to his coat. I tried. I, I, uh, I did everything. I could. He go up. I did. I did everything, Daddy. Then you know what he did, Daddy? Daddy, you know what he did? I thought he'd love me. He said, if, if you let me go, I'm going to kill you. He threatened to kill me, Daddy. Daddy, Daddy threatened to kill me. <laughs> and so... People, this girl's creative. I don't think I was as creative as she was. She had to present this so that her life indeed would be saved. But Saul would turn on her. Right, right. 18, let me read it here. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel. What an image. To Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoah. David fled and got back in the company of the man who had anointed him in his youth. Sometimes when you're going through something, God will cause you to reconnect with somebody who saw the God in you who celebrated the God in you, who spoke life in you, who saw beyond whatever was going on and reminded you, come on now, what is it that God spoke over your life? God is not a man. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to lie. He's going to stand over his word to perform it. So no matter what goes wrong in your life, no matter what you go through, God's hand and his plan is still upon you. So sometimes... Sometimes you have to go back and reconnect. I like when that happens. Reconnect with people. Reconnect with the purpose, come on now, that God has hovering over your life. Huh? God's purpose doesn't change. He hangs over his will, his word to perform it. And all we've got to do is yield and say yes. Yes to his will. Yes to his way. You have to be reminded about God's plan for your life. They go down to Nioth. That's my last word, Nioth. It means, right, right, right. It means habitations, dwelling places, right? This is a place, picture it, where prophets, yes, 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 where prophets were being trained. 
This is a place where prophets are being trained. In other words, David ends up in a place where they are speaking life. Prophetic words are words of life. Uh -huh. uh, they are speaking what he has not been hearing. Come on now. He's he been around Saul. Been around Philistines. All he's been hearing is about death. How his nobody, how his God's nobody. Wants to know, well, you better change your company. When people are only speaking death over you, speaking negative over you, you better get up and go back to, go to a place called Nayoth. Go to a place where they're going to speak words of empowerment, speak words of you can do this. Yeah, speak words of you will be more than a conqueror. Speak words of no matter what goes on, God has already given you the victory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're speaking what he hasn't been hearing. David needs this place. Come on, I said, the mighty warrior. Huh? The mighty warrior needed Nioth. No matter how strong you are, no matter how confident you are, hey, listen, listen, no matter how gifted you are, even with God's anointing, you sometimes got to get down to the place of habitation where they're speaking words of life. They ain't speaking no new car. David don't need a new car. He don't need another wife. He don't need a, a coat. He, he needs words of life. He needs to be reminded what God has spoken. Don't have an itching ear to hear the flowery things. Oh, I see a man. Oh, I see a woman. Oh, I see this. I don't want to see nothing but God's word. God doesn't hang over your word to perform it. God hangs over his own words. His own words. Glory to God. David needs this place. It's a needful place. God has prepared. I love this. God had prepared this place, Queen, before he even was a shepherd boy. Before he was even conceived, God had prepared a place that he would need to be at. Oh, that's a restful place. Sometimes people think they end up in church just to end up. You think you think just God prepared it for you. So he ends up in this place prepared before the murderous plot. This is an opportunity, another window of opportunity for David to be, here we go, refueled. Lord have mercy. Once in a while, you just need to stop, world to stop. I had it this weekend. And just get refueled. Just do nothing. Just look at the water. Good Lord. Just know that God allowed you to be in the most beautiful island. Just take a break. Yeah. He can rest. And this is what God will do. After you have been on the run, after you have been on the defense, after you have had to look over your shoulders night and day and day and night, God will give you rest. Musicians, Brother Rodney. God has a place that in the midst of your warfare, he has a place where his word's being spoken. Because you need it. Don't go seven days without hearing from God. It makes a weak human being. Don't let other stuff just continue to take preeminence over the divine word of God. It's, it's never about the preacher. Hear me. It's, it's never about the preacher. It's not about the singing. It's not about my wonderful leadership. It's really not about... It's always about what is God saying to you. Your destiny is what's at risk. My destiny is not at risk because I'm going to do what God has called me to do. What are you going to do? you got a window of opportunity today. A window of opportunity. you got us. This hourglass. Only so much time. Listen, listen. The conviction that you feel now, when that time runs out, you ain't going to feel it like that this afternoon. You're not going to feel it like that tomorrow, next week. Because you may not be in the same environment. And so that's why now, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It never says tomorrow. 
because we don't know if we're going to have tomorrow. And if we have tomorrow, we don't know how we're going to handle tomorrow. 